Well, welcome everybody to our second uh, Grand Challenges lecture of this year's programme from the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I, I do apologise uh, for the delay in getting going this evening. We've been experiencing some uh, technical difficulties and it's with the help of, uh, of, of Scott and others that we've been able to uh, get the show on the road. So welcome, as I said, to this evening's talk uh, from Rob Hopkins. The title of his talk is From What If to What Next? How to Build an Imagination Infrastructure. Briefly, for those of you who may be new to these events, the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences is a vibrant, welcoming hub which distills Kiel's long history and commitment to interdisciplinary research and teaching and learning. More information is available on the ILAS website at www.keel.ac.uk forward slash ILAS, ILAS, where you can also see videos of previous Grand Challenges lectures. So it's our very great pleasure to invite Rob Hopkins to deliver this evening's lecture. Rob is co-founder of Transition Network and Transition Town Totners, an author of several books, including The Transition Handbook, The Power of Just Doing Stuff, and most recently, From What Is to What If, Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. He presents the From What If to What Next podcast and does a lot of public speaking and writing. He's also a founder director of the New Lion Brewery in Totnes, the UK's first 100% community owned brewery and of Totnes Community Development Society. Rob holds a PhD from the University of Plymouth, as well as two honorary doctorates from the University of the West of England and from Namur in Belgium. He's a member of the National Steering Group of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. His blog is robhopkins.net and in his spare time he gardens, draws and makes lino prints. Rob will be very happy to take some questions at the end of this lecture. Uh, there's the opportunity for the audience to engage through the Q&A portal on the right hand side of the screen. So please do join the conversation and we'll endeavour to pose as many questions as time allows. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Rob for this evening's lecture. Rob, over to you. Okay, good. All right. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to, I want to start, I guess, with a little bit of what Extinction Rebellion called Tell the Truth, which is why we need to be having this conversation about imagination and the need to build imagination infrastructure. So we are in a climate and ecological emergency, which is accelerating at a speed which is, uh, which is terrifying. And uh, it's something whereby, uh, you know, we're about to have COP26, really, you'll be, where you'll be hearing lots of people talking about net, uh, net zero by 2050, which, as Peter Kalmus wrote last week, there are just two problems with those 16 words. The first bit is net zero, and the second bit is 2050, because the net zero bit imagines there'll be some amazing technology which will come along and hoover all the CO2 uh, out of the air, which doesn't exist yet. And 2050, it contains no urgency, no sense of imperative at all. And actually, the scientists that I speak to say, actually, what we need to be looking at is genuine zero by 2030, by 2035, which is a much, much bigger feat of the imagination. Uh, and the next picture here, this is, I was in Belgium recently, where they had most terrible floods, and in Germany as well, of course, which has been happening in many other parts of the world already. But this is something which is really um, uh, accelerate, uh, sorry, um, which is I met people who've been really personally affected by this and the trauma of, of what's happening. And to, to move on to this, I'm showing you this not as a graph because it's too late in the evening for graphs, frankly, but I'm showing it to you more as a, as a kind of an analogy. I like to look at this as being like a mountain that in the last 150 years, we have climbed and climbed to the top of this mountain in the global north. And we stand here now with more spectacular views possibly than anybody had before, some people anyway. But beneath our feet now is more debt, more carbon, more inequality, more anxiety than we ever stood on top of before. And the guides who are at our side, who got us up here, who know this mountain really well, are pointing to the dark storm clouds that are threatening and that are moving in very quickly. And they're saying, we need to get down very quickly off this mountain. You can see the clouds that, that, that are coming. And for some people, that's okay. 
we listen to them, they're the experts. But for a lot of people, that really, really doesn't seem to be working. And if that had have been working, the idea of giving people enough information, we'd have started in the 80s, and as you can see, it would have been an awful lot easier. So the thing that I'd like to introduce to this conversation this evening is what if we reframed this? So we looked at the lower slopes of this graph as being the the, the lower valleys, the slopes of, the, of this mountain. And we talk to people about the, the, the welcome that awaits us there, the warm firesides, the delicious food and drink, the, the, the beautiful, comfortable beds, the dry socks that wait for us when we get down there. And then our work becomes not the work of trying to sort of terrify people into moving. It becomes the work of cultivating longing. How do we cultivate longing for a low carbon future? How do we talk about it in such a way that it becomes so delicious and irresistible to people that that's uh, what we, we couldn't live without creating that? And that's the work of imagination and storytelling and creativity and poetry. Um, and to move on to the next one here, this is, this is uh, you know, you'll all know this book, Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. He wrote that book because he was, he was challenged by his publisher to write a book that just used 50 words. And I, talk, I mention this because the imagination loves limits. The imagination thrives best with limits. And when I talk about imagination, uh, John Dewey's definition of it is my favorite one. He said it's the ability to see things as if they could be otherwise, which is a superpower that we absolutely need in 2021. And, uh, and, and that, but some research that was published here in, 2020, in, in 2011 that made the front page of Newsweek magazine by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim in America showed that IQ and imagination had risen together till the mid 90s, at which point imagination uh, started to decline while IQ continued to rise. And when this was published, it made the front page of Newsweek magazine. It was a really big story. Uh, and people talked about, well, what does this mean for economic growth? My concern has always been, what does this mean for the climate movement, for the social justice movement, for the new economy movement? Because if, as Walida Amirisha puts it, if you cannot build what you cannot imagine, Mariame Kaba, who's an incredible prison abolitionist campaigner, uh, she says, we live in a system that has been locked into a false sense of inevitability. And I worry that we might end up being the civilization whose epitaph is this, is this. Really? It wasn't that hard. Really, you couldn't figure out a way to create a society in which people could live, could live thriving, uh, connected, uh, satisfying lives that used a fraction of the CO2 that was used in 2021. Really? You couldn't do that? That would be the most pathetic reason to go extinct. So um, in, this, in terms of the question about how we might cultivate longing. This is the work of a guy called James Mackay at the University of Leeds who draws the future. And I love his drawings. This is his picture of what a city would look like if we decided in 2021 we wanted to make it the most biodiverse city it could be. What might it be like in 2030? And an image like this helps us to imagine what it might smell like, and sound like, and feel like, how it would be different and yet in many ways the same to the world that we're in here in 2021. This is his picture of um, streets as we take cars out of cities, which is happening in, happening in more and more cities now. What do we do with that space instead? And maybe we fill those streets with gardens, our children can walk to, 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 to school like this. The poet Rilke once said something to the effect that, uh, uh, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens, which is so beautiful. I'm going to say it again. The future must in enter into you a long time before it happens. And images like this, I think, really, really allow us to do that. This is Fleet Street in London, which uh, maybe you know Fleet Street. I'm sure, you know, many streets like this, we walk down them. They always look like this. It's hard to imagine them as being anything other than this. So London National Park City Project made this little animation, which um, hopefully the person controlling the slides will press play now and you'll see this street magically transform. And what's beautiful about that, I think, is that once you see this fleet street like this, it's really hard to, un to, to unsee that. And when I look at it, I think, wow, well, what would it be like to live in London that felt more like a forest with some buildings in it? than a city with some trees in it? What would mental health be like in a city like that? What work would people do? Uh, what would it sound like to walk through a city like that? You know, at this point you might be thinking, well, Rob, that's all very nice, but in the real world, that sort of thing is never gonna happen. Well, this is in, 
Barcelona, where the municipality in Barcelona announced a few months ago they were going to close 30% of the streets in the centre of the city, and they're going to turn those streets into forests and fill them with places for play and community and connection. This is really like the, the future of, of urban planning, I think, now how we design cities beyond the car in a way that people and new economies and biodiversity are really able to thrive in those spaces. And this is something that I came across recently, uh, which is a street in Amsterdam in 2016, uh, when it looked like this. And if you go to the next picture, that's what it looks like today. And uh, whoever's fingers on the controller, you might like to toggle backwards and forwards between those two a little bit, because that was how I first saw them as a GIF on Twitter. And I thought, are those just amazing? Because what were the conversations that people had when it looked like it did in 2016 that unlocked it looking like that in 2021? What were the connections that were made? What were the what if questions people asked each other that allowed that transformation to happen? Because that's the sort of stuff that we need to know. You know, we, we talk a lot about dystopias. Hollywood makes them all the time. We're surrounded by dystopian visions of the future. There are less utopias, but we come across them sometimes. I think what we need now are what Rupert Reed calls throughtopias, which is the stories we tell today about how in 2021 we came together and we made the shift. And stories like what would have been told in this street in 2021 are a really key part of that, I think. So again, you might be thinking, well, yeah, but you know, in the real world, how does this stuff ever actually happen? This is a, a town in France called Montsartu. It's about half an hour inland from Nice. And uh, I went there a couple of years ago and it blew me away. So a few years ago, the French government said to schools in France that 20% of food in school meals should be organic. So in Montsartu, the people who run the schools and the municipality said, well, if 20% is better than 0%, why do we stop at 20%? Let's just go all the way to 100%. So the municipality in the next picture bought this piece of land and turned it into a market garden, which you can see then in the next picture. This garden employs three or four people. They grow 70% of all the food for all the schools. All the food now is freshly prepared. The kids are involved in growing it. The kids are involved in cooking it. One of the things they found was that, it was also the first town I've ever been to with a goth mayor. He was very cool. He looked like he was at a green day or something. And um, uh, one of the things they found was really unexpected levels of change in families. So 60% of families with kids in the school who before had never bought organic food started to buy organic food, which was pretty incredible. Um, so the thing that I want to share with you this evening is this, and it's called the Imagination Sundial. And afterwards, I can send a link for where you can download a high resolution version of this so you don't need to be squinting and all the little writing around the edge. This came out of conversations when I had just finished writing from what is to what if uh, and my housemate at the time Rob Shorter who now works for the uh, Donut Economic Do Donut uh, Ec Economics Action Lab he um, he'd read the book and then together from conversations that we had we created this. So this is an attempt to say okay what if we recognize in 2021 that our collective imagination, which should be a well-toned muscle, is actually sort of absolutely not that? And what we need to do is to turn that around. Where do we start? So I want to go through each of these four things and tell you some stories. The first is space. The imagination needs space. The imagination needs time, both, both of which are things that, uh, that are in very, very short supply in our lives today, as a result of which our imaginations are really uh, quite impoverished. And um, in 20, uh, just before COVID, which is where a big community event that we ran, which was based around uh, what we might do as a community around, about the climate emergency. These kind of community what-if spaces don't happen unless we create them. And, uh, you know, Albert Einstein always said his best ideas came to him when he rode his bicycle in the forest. If we don't have time and space, it's very hard to live imaginative lives. We're all so busy. We carry these very addictive devices in our pockets that devour that space. Uh, and how many great ideas that could be seminal in the challenges that we face now disappear because 
we're just distracted so much of the time. As Sherry Turkle says, we are forever elsewhere. Um, so, and I also love this story I came across recently, and I just think it's fantastic. I just thought well, I want to tell you about it. In 1964, when the US and Russia were competing to get the first man on the moon, a man called Edward Makuka Unkoloso, who lived in Zambia, uh, announced that Zambia was going to put a man on the moon, was, was going to get to the moon first. And the Zambian space program was something which he then, uh, he, he organized, uh, had a team of people. This was how he trained people for weightlessness in, in, in space, was to roll them down the hill in a barrel. And uh, he also announced they were going to go to Mars. Uh, at the same time uh, with a 17-year-old uh, girl, two cats, uh, and a missionary, although the missionary was told that if the Martians weren't that bothered about Christianity, he wasn't to force it on them. And at the time, he was derided as being a complete lunatic. But now, in the Afrofuturist movement, he's seen as being quite a sort of a seminal figure because he was able to tell a different story to a newly independent Zambia. You know, why shouldn't we the first person on the moon be from Zambia. Why shouldn't uh, Zambia have a have a space mission? And uh, you know, this sort of creating space within a culture for for stories and for really thinking outside the box, I think, is really precious too. Um, the second one is place. And place, but what I mean by place is places that you go to where afterwards when you go home again, you look at that place through very different eyes and its possibilities. This is Waterloo Bridge in London in April 2019 when Extinction Rebellion blocked that bridge uh, and turned it into a forest for two weeks. They put trees all down the middle of that, of that bridge. And for those two weeks, people got to experience that bridge, normally just traffic going backwards and forwards as if it was actually... Um, uh, a forest, and people would stop and say, oh, why can't it be like this all the time? And once you've seen it like that, I think it's really, really hard to unsee it. It's what I like to think of as pop-up tomorrows. How do we take spaces that people are really familiar with in 2021 and use them to give people a taste of a different 2030 now? This is in Houston. A friend of mine called Jason Roberts runs a project called Better Block. Better Block go to a place like this, which nobody loves, they talk to the people around, they say, what does this place need? What do you long for? And then they transform that place into that, which is, they fill it with conviviality and conversation and connection. It's a kind of a pop-up tomorrow. And, and I think these things are so powerful. And this is in San Francisco, where a group of artists came together to try and figure out where, how they could find affordable exhibition space in San Francisco. Pretty difficult thing to find. And then one of them said, well, if you buy a ticket for a car parking space, is there a rule that says you have to put a car in it? Surely, actually, you could do anything you wanted. You could curl up in it and go to sleep if you wanted to. So they started an event called Parking Day, where people would go into town, buy a parking ticket, and turn parking spaces into gardens like this, into little cafes, into little libraries, places for games, little yoga studios. Again, it's a kind of a pop tomorrow. 1968 in Paris, the anarchists, the, 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 in the student revolution, that they used to say, beneath the road, the beach. And this is a bit like the same thing, you know. Well, what, what else could be here in, in, instead of a tarmac? Let's give people a taste of it. And all too often when we talk about climate change, we talk about positive feedbacks, you know, the, the ice melts, so the sea, there's more dark sea, so more ice melts, there's more dark sea, and so on. I think we lose sometimes the, the, the sense of how, of how community-led, bottom-up action can also build positive feedbacks in a good way. This is in Wellington in Somerset, where they formed a transition group uh, in about 2010, and then they created a community garden on some allotments, uh, which was going really well. And uh, and then the, someone said, to them, Look, there's this whole acre along here behind these houses. Is it's full of weeds and animals, can you do anything there? So they cleared all the weeds, they designed it in consultation with the neighbours, and they created a, a food forest, which has been really successful. So then next, their municipality said, well, look, we've got this eight and a half acres here, can you do anything with that? So they did a huge community consultation. They used the front of local shops in the high street to do that. They ran a consultation that consulted many, many hundreds of people, what should happen here, and got a very, very clear feedback from them about the main things that should happen. They had an artist who came in and did artist impressions to help people that being planted. And then recently their local government said, we've got this 
40 acre strip around the side of the town would you like to create a green corridor around the side of the town with other groups so when people start a project you never know where it's going to go what it's going to lead to what it's going to unlock so the power of places to give us a taste of a different future in an immersive way is something we really shouldn't underestimate i think the third thing on the sundial is practices and this is a really important part of your brain called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is where your imagination and your memory both fire from the part of the brain also which is particularly vulnerable to cortisol so when we are anxious or stressed or traumatized it can shrink by up to 20 percent when that happens people lose the capacity to imagine the future in positive and hopeful ways and they just get very stuck in the present uh, and the past so i wanted to find a place where people were intentionally trying to rebuild the hippocampus and there's a really important aspect to this which i think is the degree to which imagination is a function of privilege if your basic needs on maslow's hierarchy of needs aren't met or if you experience systemic racism economic exclusion it's very hard to live an imaginative life so i went to dundee to a project called Archangel, run by this incredible woman called Rosalie Summerton. They work with people with mental health problems, burnout. They say, when you come here, you're not a patient or a client, you're an artist who is preparing work for an exhibition, which they put on every year in the center of Dundee in the main art gallery there. And I spoke to so many people who were happy to tell me their stories about how being part of Art Angel had changed their idea, had changed their, their well-being and their approach. One of the things they do every year to see how well they're doing is to give their artists a piece of paper with two outlines of a human body on and to say, fill the first one to show how you felt before you came here and the second to show how you feel now you've been coming here for a while. And I looked through a big pile of these, which is very moving. I just want to share one with you here, which really leapt out to me. Because when I look at that, firstly, I see the power of what they do in Art Angel. I see what it looks like when someone's hippocampus is able to rebuild itself. Um, and also uh, the power of art. But when I look at it and I think, you know, today I was just reading climate scientists whose work I really, really respect, who were saying it's not about net zero by 2050. It's about genuinely zero carbon by 2030, 2035 at the latest. That's a much, much taller order than just saying we need to have more electric cars and air source heat pumps. It's a profound rethinking, reimagining of everything. And what would it be like if we actually succeeded in doing that? If the next 10 years were a time of such extraordinary reimagining, a time when anything felt possible, a time when we could when we, we could reimagine everything, what would it feel like to live through a revolution of the imagination? I have no idea, I've never lived through one, but this picture for me really is what is what gets me out of bed in the morning to do the work that I do, because that's what I think it would feel like. So in terms of exercises and practices, this is something we developed in the transition movement called Transition Town Anywhere. You start with, you need a big space. This is Battersea Arts Center. You need between 100 and 400 people. You start by closing your eyes and imagining you're in a 2030 that has, a, that has managed that. And then you meet other people who share what your interest is in, in that future. And then you build it literally with cardboard, string, sticky tape, bamboo canes. You build next a three-dimensional version of that world next which you then live in and trade in and inhabit. And to be among 300 adults lost in a play world of their imagining is just one of the most beautiful, extraordinary things I've ever been part of. And it leads to very real tangible change. That's me there in 2012, the first time we did it. And this is uh, where I ended up with a group of people where we imagined a brewery and a bakery and a mill in the same building. I was like, well, if, if a low carbon future is worth fighting for, it's definitely gonna have that in it. And um, the next year in my town, we started a brewery called the New Lion Brewery. And then a few years after that, we then turned that brewery into a 100% community owned brewery. We have now have 270 owners. We raised 180,000 pounds. And when people would say, how do you know this is going to work? I would say, because I've played it. You know, and there's something, and I spoke to so many people who've done that activity and then did in real life what it was that they played. And now the New Line Brewery next is a thriving enterprise. We employ 12 or 13 people. Uh, we run all kinds of events and uh, are a real kind of force for good in the area. So if you're ever down, do come and visit. Next.
So one of the main practices, I think, that we really have to get good at is the ability to ask a really good what-if question. And a what-if question, a good what-if question gives us a, a sort of a taste of a different future uh, that we can then sort of, it's a bit like an Alice in Wonderland where she can look through the little door into the garden. We can see it, get enough of a taste for it that that's what we want to make happen. So this is in Tooting in South London. Transition Town Tooting, fantastic, really active group. They have, there's nowhere in Tooting that's like a town square or a village green or a place that it could be. Just off the, the high street in Tooting is this, which is a bus turning circle, normally full of buses waiting with their engines idling. And one day, Transition Town Tooting, one July Sunday day, they, they turned that space into, they ran an event they called the Tooting Twirl, they crowdfunded £2,000, and for the day, they turned that space into what it would be like if it already was a village green. So they filled it with flowers and coffee and conversation and music and carnival. They invited uh, as much of the diversity of the, of the community as, as they could, and they held this incredible day. I got to sit there with my feet on the green, green grass of Tooting, uh, and many people did too. And that was real grass, by the way. And what I noticed during the day with that question, what if this space was our village green, was that during the day something shifted. So at the beginning, people would say, if this was our village green, da 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 da, da. by the afternoon people were saying, when this is our village green, da 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 da, da. like somewhere deep underneath, the, the sense of permission shifted in an incredible way. And people would sit and look at this wall here, the wall of Primark, which normally you would never look at. You would just walk past. I doubt anyone ever stops and looks at this wall. I heard people say, when this is our village green, what story about ourselves are we going to paint on this wall? How are we going to celebrate who we are and what we're all about uh, on this wall? And so the ability to get the question right can unlock so much. And one of the best examples of that is this, which is in Liège in Belgium. They had a very active transition group. I went there uh, about nine years ago. And the transition group had come up with a question. What if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège? Which is such a beautiful question. I love it. It's so... Uh, it, it gives you such a rich taste of a different way of looking at what the future could be. They did a big event. They invited everyone in the city who cared about food. I then went back again a few years later. And in that time in Liège, they had created 27 new cooperatives. And they had raised 5 million euros of investment in those cooperatives, not from um, the banks, but from the people of Liège, who had put their own money in to make this uh, a reality. And... Um, they, and they started a bank, a, a farm, two vineyards, a, a brewery, these shops called the Small Producers, which were doing so well uh, after six. The first one was doing so well after six months, they opened a second. They now have four. I met the mayor of the city who said, this is now the story of our city. We want to transform uh, the economy of this place. Our role is just to remove the blockages and the obstacles to this growing and growing and growing. So, And it's now how the municipalities are, are reimagining the, how the universities, the schools, the hospitals are going to procure their food. Uh, and this model is spreading to other cities across Belgium. So something profound is shifting because they got the right what if question uh, at the beginning. And when I said to the guy who was coordinating it, have you managed to raise that much money? He said, we had a good narrative. We had a great story and people want to support that story. So I've loved seeing during lockdown how um, the number of transition groups who have used what if as the framing for where we go from here. This is a transition group in Cornwall who I did some work with. And every day for, for the month before I gave a talk, they posted a different what if question on social media. And they were beautiful. Let's just go through some of these. So there was, yeah, what if birdsong drowned out the traffic? What if car parks became play parks? Next. What if our verges are full of wildflowers and lockdown community spirit continued post-COVID? Next. What if there was a daily imagination lesson? And then by the time they did this one, this last one here, they didn't need all the wording anymore. And they used an image which I thought was just perfect, you know, that we live in a, a neoliberal economy which is based on, on triggering dopamine, selling us things that give us a short-term pleasure release but then aren't sufficiently nourishing and then we need some more, whether it's handbags or chocolate or whatever it is. And 
we know that when you design an economy like that, you inevitably see a rise in addiction and a rise in depression. And actually, this picture speaks about going through that, beyond that. And every time I do the time travel exercise that I do with people, we always, uh, and I ask people to imagine the future, they always talk about a future like this, a future with louder birdsong, cleaner air, stronger community. And so connecting into a future that's about well-being and contentment is such a powerful thing to do, I think. Next. So this is in Camden in London. Um, I'm nearly there and then we'll have some time for questions. I hope this is working for you, by the way, me being on the phone and doing the slides like this. Um, so this is in Camden, who were the first municipality, the first council in London to declare a climate emergency, the first to um, uh, do a citizens assembly on climate change. And then as a result of that, working with the local transition group and the local XR group, they started this thing called Think and Do where they took over an old cafe and they turned it into Think and Do, which was a kind of a community what-if space. And loads of different groups in the community were invited in and asked to share their visions of the future, their what-if questions, and also to write stories from a 2030 that's not utopia, that's not a dystopia, but that is the result of us having done everything we possibly could have done in those intervening nine years. What would it be like? What's the future that you long for? And they asked people to write stories. And then they created a version of their local newspaper, which is called normally called the Camden New Journal. They created an edition called the Camden Future Journal that was full of those stories. Again, as Rilke said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And these sorts of things are just beautiful, uh, I think. So my last bit of the imagination sundial is packed which is a weird word to use in relation to the imagination. It's not a very imagine kind of a word, really. But this is in Bologna. <clears throat> so in Bologna, the municipality um, noticed there was a real decline in engagement in democracy, in civic participation in the city. And so they, they started something called a civic imagination office, not a civic participation office or a civic engagement office. It was a civic imagination office with six laboratories in different neighborhoods around the city. And in each one, they would run big events like this open space, world cafe, visioning futures kind of events. The beautiful thing was that at the end of it, they would sit down with the community and say, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Okay. How do we make that happen? Let's make a pact. We can offer this, this, and this. You can offer that and that. Good. Let's make a pact. And in the last five years in Bologna, they've made 500 pacts which range from small things like making new benches on the street or something to really big ambitious things, taking old empty office blocks, turning them into schools to train young people as classical musicians and, and things like that. So at a time when in our, in our lives as citizens, as employees, as students, our imaginations are so rarely invited and when they are, they tend to be a bit patronized, a bit belittled, kind of patted on the head and then ignored. To create a way of drawing imagination up and building confidence in it through a society feels really important to me. And the story of the Civic Imagination Office and its pacts felt like a beautiful example of that. So that's what I've wanted to share with you tonight in this slightly unorthodox uh, way of doing this, which is the imagination sundial. I hope it's something that you might find useful. I think it will work in lots and lots of different settings. Um, and as I said, I'll give a link where you can download this in, in high resolution. Uh, so just this penultimate slide here, I want to just mention a little bit about the transition movement, which, uh, which is for me one of the most beautiful expressions of this, which is something that I was involved in founding in 2005, 2006. You can now find transition groups in 50 countries around the world, in many, many thousands of communities. And that's really an approach which says, um, Okay, well, where do we start? Let's start here with what we have, with the people that we have, with what we're passionate about, and people starting small projects like planting productive trees in their neighborhoods or new community gardens to more ambitious things like community co-housing projects, community energy companies, to really transformative, ambitious stuff like they're doing in Liège. All of those things really matter because they give people a taste in 2021 of what 2030 could and needs to be like. Um, and uh, I spoke to some people in Transition Crystal Palace who had started a food market. And I said, why do you do this? And they 
said, because we want our children to grow up thinking that this is normal. And that feels to me like what a lot of this is all about, is how do we take this future that at the, at the moment looks really uncertain and terrifying to people and replace that vision uh, with something much better. We used to have I have a dream politicians, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy. When we don't have that anymore, the future becomes increasingly uh, uh, um, sort of dystopian and strange, which allows other people to step in and say, uh, with the politics of nostalgia, and we're going to go back and we're going to make America great again and all that kind of thing. So so imagination is, is fundamentally important and creating the infrastructure for it in our society feels like to me like a prerequisite for many of the other things that we need to do. So just to wrap up there, if you want to find out anything else about who I am and what I do, uh, robhopkins.net, you can find all the interviews that went into the book there and a lot of other things too. Transitionnetwork.org is where you can find out more about the transition movement and the podcast that I do if you've enjoyed this talk and the book, the podcast from what if to what next comes out every two weeks. You can find it on all good podcast providers. But if you were, uh, if you um, subscribe at patreon.com slash from what if to what next, you also get the Ministry of Imagination bonus episodes. You get them when they're released uh, and other things as well. So I hope this has worked. I hope you're all still there. I'm just sitting here in my garden. It's slightly surreal. So hopefully you're all still there and this works. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you.